salamander adventure. Our plan this week was to make you hike up a really high hill and <laughs> really tire you out. So you're going to have to do that part on your own. Uh, if you want to replicate that, you could like jog in place or something while we're doing this. <laughs> but we have some, some great guests today to, to, to talk with you. Um, some old friends of Waterkeeper and uh, um, really important people in the environmental movement today that you're going to meet. And uh, we're going we're gonna to have a great time on our salamander adventure. Um, not just talking about salamanders, they're really important, but also in the bigger picture, you know, their role as an indicator species for the health of our woodlands and, and our, our wild places. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit also about how we preserve rare species in general um, today. So we have lots of ground to cover, literally and figuratively. So if you have questions um, for our guests, you know, please go ahead as usual and type them into the chat and myself or Alex can read them. Um, and if you, you know, want to talk in person, I know sometimes, Tom, you're a good one for asking questions in person, <laughs> and uh, you're all welcome to do that to unmute yourself and, and hop in with a question at any point. Um, so we have, a, we have a great full house today, as always. Uh, Jackie, Ken, there's 25 of us, just so you know. <laughs> so you have a full class with you today, um, but, or, or, or just about that. Um, so. I'm going to hand it over, Ron, if you guys are ready, I'm going to hand it over if, if Jackie and Ken, if you could just give us a little bit of your personal background and then tell us a little bit about Nature Sanctuary Society and, and where we are today. Okay. First of all, it's a great honor to be with everybody. Uh, it's just a very special opportunity to be with you and to show you our beautiful preserve and explore for salamanders. And I am Jacqueline Courtney Swift. I'm the president of the Nature Sanctuary Society. I became president in 2011. And uh, I'm just very passionate about the group and what we do. The society started back in 1934 at the Buffalo Museum of Science. And back then, uh, Dr. William Prindle Alexander uh, was teaching classes up there as part of the Hayes uh, lecture series. And he became concerned about his students in that when they came out looking for places to explore, there was more and more destruction, more posted signs. So he decided in 1934 to create the society, the Nature Sanctuary Society of Western New York. And this preserve that we're in is named after him. And ever since then, the mission has changed very little. From the beginning, it's been all about saving rare species, habitats, geology, and all about um, scientific research and education. So that's what we do today. And this particular preserve uh, is saved by our ownership of it, as well as the rest of our sanctuaries. We have uh, five other sanctuaries, and when we own them, they're permanently protected, and our stewardship is a model of uh, preserving and protecting all the rare species and habitats, uh, which brings us to focus on one of the major focuses in stewardship is invasive species. So we're just all about protecting these rare, rare places. Another facet of that protection is keeping the preserve very private. The only um, people allowed in them are our members or uh, special tours uh, like yours would have been um, by special permission of the board. And occasionally we'll get a complaint about that because people want the public to come in, but uh, to us, the preservation of the biodiversity is all about uh, just letting the, the sanctuaries be. And we do a minimal amount of uh, restoration, invasive species removal, but we, we don't want them to be loved to death, which happens to uh, many public parks and places like that. So that's uh, how we protect the species in our sanctuaries. Now I wanna take a little bit before we go on the adventure to tell you about the sanctuary itself. But are there any questions uh, before we move on? Jackie, I don't know, I might have, you may have mentioned this. Uh, did, did you tell people how many preserves they are and kind of the area that your organization covers? 
Okay, we have a total of six right now. And uh, most of them are in Cattaraugus. We're in, right now we're in Southern Erie and um, the rest are in Cattaraugus County. We have a couple we're uh, possibly going to take on in Chautauqua County also. Great, thank you. Yep. So this sanctuary is outrageous, right, Ron? It's amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Ken and I are trying to keep our distance, but <laughs> we're so passionate about this group and the work that we do. And this place right here is just amazing. And I can't wait to bring you back uh, as a group uh, in, you know, in the physical setting. Uh, right now at this point where we're standing is uh, 1,200 feet above sea level. And we are on the edge of what geologically is called a terrace. And down below, uh, maybe Ron can scan that, we're looking at the main branch of Cattaraugus Creek. So that elevation is a thousand feet above sea level. So you're looking at a 200 foot drop here. And um, we're, have it, we're doing some geology research now, uh, right into the side of this cliff where we're standing. And it's fascinating. There's clay, a lot of clay layers, and it makes the, um, the land just slump off, almost looks like slices of bread. And uh, it's amazing. So you can see how a lot of trees have slid down the slope. Um, we have trees down below that are actually split like this. They're still growing, but because of that, those clay layers, they've just split apart. And we could do a whole class on those and the geology here. And um, another thing on, down on the floodplain, we have one of the largest populations of, of Virginica, or Virginica, no, it's Mertensia Virginica, bluebells. So it's one of the largest populations in western New York. They'll be peaking in uh, a couple weeks, so that's always something to see. The society does have a um, field trip planned. If anybody wants to come along, uh, we can take, we're taking out small groups of 10, so you could sign up for that, and Robin can give you information on that later. Um, so we have this beautiful floodplain up here on the terrace, there's old growth trees. We're gonna see a couple of them over by the Vernal Pool, but most of them are behind me to the east. There's enormous trees, uh, red oaks, beeches, maples, all kinds. And so again, most of them are up here on the terrace. So today we're gonna to, um, take a, a look at salamanders in the Vernal Pool. And that's over here to my um, left and Ken's our her professional herpetologist who's going to be our guide. So Jackie and Ken, everyone agrees that this place is very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. Uh, my name is Ken Robley. Um, I joined the society a number of years ago when Jackie invited me to uh, join the membership. I have retired from the New York State DEC where I was a diversity biologist for uh, New York State BC Bureau of Wildlife. And I <clears throat> put in just a, uh, 39 years uh, working in the wildlife field. And fortunately, during the last years, I got to work uh, as a diversity biologist where I got to work with really interesting species like bald eagles and um, hellbenders and reptiles and amphibians. So um, I've got some expertise in herpetology and Hopefully today the salamanders will cooperate and, and we will have a salamander adventure, but we're at least going to see their habitat and we're going to learn about, you know, how special this particular site is for uh, mole salamanders. So uh, I think maybe we'll start over toward the vernal pool. Uh, this pool is uh, quite unique because it's perched 200 feet above Cataraugus Creek at the very top of a knoll here. And uh, what makes it important is we have, uh, you know, old growth forest here. We've got good, a good canopy that shades the pool. And the pool um, is a, 
natural depression that was left up here, uh, apparently by glacial action, and it's providing a nice vernal pool for breeding of not only mole salamanders, but for also other amphibians like wood frogs and, and other vernal pool specialists. So we're gonna head over toward the vernal pool. You're gonna get a look at that now. I wanna add one more thing. Sure. I just wanna add a little bit more about location. Um, we're in the Lake Erie watershed and the creek is the main branch of the Cattaraugus Creek. And this winds around in an enormous curve around the boundary, the Eastern boundary of the sanctuary. And the sanctuary is 118.5 acres. Okay. Thanks guys. I want to add a little thought as uh, we're walking over here to the pond that, uh, to the vernal pool that um, Nature Sanctuary Society is a little different um, from the, the land trust that we talked about a few sessions ago was the Western New York Land Conservancy. And that group does uh, what we call easements. We talked about conservation easements. Uh, Nature Sanctuary Society uh, with Ken and Jackie specifically purchases land. So they only own and hold land. They don't do the easement, um, they buy it. So this is a very different strategy and it's a, it's, it's a nice solid way to protect land forever um, because they have full ownership of the property once they commit to a site. I want to show you this is for scale. <laughs> small, but I'm not that small. How is the sun angle here? They, uh, Robin's going to have to tell us if they can see um, with the reflection. This is, this is pretty good, guys. But Ron, you will actually have to stop. You'll have to stop when you can because uh, we lose the picture when uh, I think when you're moving around, it's too much data. Okay. So if you can find a good spot to kind of stop, I, I think we'll get better uh, view. And it probably will make the sound a little better. Um, if you guys want to put comments on the sound, I know I'm talking while Ron is walking. Sometimes that causes you to lose sound. So please let me know. I can't tell from the sense. So let me know if we're losing sound or if it's cutting in and out. Um, you can put it up in the chat or send it to me uh, just so that I know what's going on. Just as good. Okay. Can you see those egg masses? Mm -hmm. Wait. That's what we're going to talk about. Okay. And I may end up having to carry the iPad out to, okay. to give them a good look. Sure. But I think right now I could just talk a little bit if, if you can focus it toward me and yeah. um, talk about what's happened here. Okay. Yeah, Ken, if you could tell us why we're at the vernal pool and uh, you know what role that plays in the salamander lifestyle, that would be wonderful. Okay. You're going to have to tell us as we're looking at the pool, Robin, if you can see the egg masses and see de any details. I, I want to point out to people, it's, I mean, it's cloudy. We see a lot of cloudiness under the reflection of the water. The reflection's pretty intense. Uh, we may have to get the iPod right down there to actually see the egg masses, but from my experience, I think I see what I'm, <laughs> I think I see them under the surface of the water, but to see them, uh, you know, close up, we may have to get the, get the iPad down there. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, this is a really an excellent example of a vernal pool. 
we've got a nice shady canopy to uh, prevent you know the pool from drying out early and it also keeps the water temperature um, down and it tends to keep other unwanted species out with the shading. Um, in pools that are completely exposed we'll see species like green frogs coming in which compete with um, wood frogs and mole salamanders uh, actually by eating their egg masses as tadpoles. So uh, a nice vernal pool and what happens here is uh, at the end of winter, early spring, usually during the first warm rain, when temperatures reach during the day to around 50 to 60 degrees, and then we get a rain um, uh, right around sunset and continuing in, uh, into the night, we get a migration of mole salamanders, um, and that's salamanders from the family Ambistomatidae. And we have two species that are actually breeding in our vernal pool here. The Jefferson salamander, which is a fairly uncommon salamander in Western New York. We have them breeding here. And then also uh, the spotted salamander um, breeds in here too. And we've seen both species on nights when we've been out uh, during that breeding migration. So the breeding migration really only happens uh, for a very brief period, um, maybe one or maybe three nights at most during that period with um, in the spring where we get warm rain. In some years that migration will actually just occur in the, much of Western New York in just one night. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a pretty fantastic thing to watch and if you would like to attend any of the outings here to the Vernal Pool, we try to schedule um, an outing with our members and guests during that migration. So that's something that you can keep in mind for the future. So uh, we have two species breeding here. Uh, we walked around the pool earlier and we were able to see egg masses from one species. I haven't been able to see a good example of egg masses from the Jeffersons, but we do have the spotted salamander egg masses. And I think uh, to get a good look at them, I'm going to try to maybe take the iPad over and uh, see if we can get a close-up of the egg masses. Okay, I'm going to try this here. Um, hey, well, this Ken's getting down into the water there. I just want to draw attention. Uh, we had a couple interesting comments here. Alex has posted some geological information on um, our Genesee Valley area and then uh, vernal pools. Amy has posted some information on vernal pools. So and here are our egg masses. Oh, cool. Yes we've got uh, these are all spotted salamander egg masses from what I can see. Uh, the spotted salamander has a globular shape mass or, and uh, you'll see that there is one white mass and the female uh, mole salamander, the female spotteds and jeffersons, they stay in the ponds after the males leave and within a couple of days they attach their eggs to the to twigs and other structure that's in the pool and you can see that it looks like the white one you can see is attached to a stem or twig in the pool. And notice that there's some, some of these are actually green in color. And that's because of algae that is, uh, has entered into the egg mass. And um, this is an example of symbiosis. Both the cell larvae and uh, the algae are benefiting from uh, being in association with each other. I'm going to try to lift uh, one of the masses up briefly to see if we can see some of the embryos. I th you should be able to see the, uh, some of the larvae inside of the mass. They're not quite ready to hatch yet. It's going to be maybe another two weeks before they start leaving the egg mass. Sometimes you can actually see them moving uh, within the mass. 
you can actually see the larvae moving inside of their if egg. people are oops sorry if people are exploring around at their houses um or if they're hiking around local parks will they be seeing this in other places right now from different species uh yes um well you're still going to see the mole salamander egg masses but some of the egg masses have or well have already hatched out your wood frogs i expect many of the wood frogs have already hatched out. Um, so the chances of seeing wood, you know, wood frog larvae in an egg mass now, it's pretty late for that. So there's, you know, a good example of the spotted salamander egg masses. I don't see any Jefferson. The Jefferson egg masses are actually more tubular in shape. And uh, that's how we usually identify them is, you know, to tell if they're spotted or uh, they are of the Jefferson um, female salamanders. So we had a question here from Vale. Uh, she would like to know approximately how many eggs could be in each mass. And then I would tack onto that, you know, how many, how many of these masses are the females laying and what, 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 what kind of population are we looking at represented here? Okay, um, for number of eggs per egg mass, um, fem each female can lay over 100, um, maybe to a, up to 150 eggs in each, each mass. And usually just one mass per female that she's staying in the pond and, and you know, attaching the structure. Now, in terms of a total population, when we've been on surveys here, we've literally um, seen more than a hundred salamanders breeding in this pond. There's probably several hundred adults that are coming to this pond and breeding. And in terms of numbers of egg masses, um, just by walking around the edge here, we can see at least 50. And so there's, there's quite a few larvae that are gonna be, you know, reared in this pond through the summer months. Now they're, they're gonna mature and uh, around the end of August and September, they're gonna start metamorphosing into young salamanders and they're gonna migrate uh, from the breeding pond uh, to, a location somewhere in the forest that they're going to set up as their home range. What's very unique about the mole salamanders is they undergo this migration, they can migrate up to a mile to reach their home breeding pond and then they return to their home territory, the rock or log that they originally traveled from. So pretty fascinating that they can navigate such distances to get to these vernal pools. And the pool is really important for the population. Without this critical habitat of the vernal pool, reproduction is not gonna occur. And that population is headed for extirpation. So that's why it's so important for people to recognize the value of these, these uh, vernal pool depressions. They're not all protected by New York State freshwater wetlands law or the federal, um, uh, wetlands law. Uh, some of them are small enough that they can be, um, you know, filled by landowners and eliminated. And at times, you know, they're providing an extremely important function for amphibians in the area. And uh, people need to recognize that because it is a, this is a critical habitat and um, the life histories of many amph um, amphibians as, as well as some of the insects and and other vernal pool obligates that inhabit these shallow temporary pools. So is there any other questions before we start searching to see if we can actually find the salamander? Uh, we're yeah, hoping, we, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we, we had a couple more pop up on the chat. Uh, Vail was wondering if they lay eggs just once in the season and then uh, Ariana wanted to know how many of the eggs in each mass would you expect to survive? Okay, yeah, they only lay just 
one uh, egg mass, as far as I know, during that very short window uh, that the, the females are still in the pond, they're finishing, you know, laying the egg mass before they return to their home territories. And that's, it's usually just a few days and I expect, you know, there might be occasions where a female might have two egg masses that it's attaching to uh, a stem or something, but a lot of times it may be just one egg mass. And what was the other question? Um, I'm sorry, uh, how, how many of the eggs in each mass uh, would survive? want to survive? Yeah. Well, um, it would be a small percentage. There's a there's predation that occurs in these pools. Uh, there's aquatic insects that prey on the larvae, predaceous diving beetles, giant water bugs, uh, even so other salamanders. Uh, Jefferson salamanders have been known to prey on the, uh, the spotted salamander larvae. And so there is predation that is occurring and that keeps whittling the numbers down. And uh, so it's probably, you know, just maybe a two or three percent of that original, you know, numbers of eggs that are in those masses that's, that are going to be able to leave the pool and uh, make it into adults. Okay. The other, other problem is disease and um, we're very concerned about the uh, chytrid fungus that is invasive um, within the United States and the world. It's the trachochytrium dendrobotitis. That particular chytrid fungus is a danger to amphibians and we're not really sure to the extent it's causing problems in uh, vernal pool salamanders, but we have seen problems in some of our other salamanders in the state. Um, so yeah, there is, uh, there's fewer salamanders that come and uh, survive that, uh, survive to adulthood and eggs are laid. That's so kind of how... I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, that's kind of how nature works. It provides mm -hmm. an excess because, uh, you know, these organisms are taking part in the food chain. They're providing food for, for other organisms in the food web here. Thanks. I, I wanted to just highlight something you said, the chytrid fungus, I know is something that's an issue for amphibians throughout the Americas. Uh, if that's correct, and I just wanted to make sure we have the spelling correct, and I wanted to see if Alex maybe could could uh, uh, take a peek around and maybe post a link to that. I believe it's C H I T R I D. Is that correct, Ken? C H Y. T R I D. Yes, chytrid. Okay. But the chytrid fungus. That's that's a generic um, group of fungi, and the particular one that is causing the damage. There's uh, is the Batrachochytrium dendrobotitis. That's a specific chytrid fungus. There are friendly chytrid funguses that exist in the environment that are doing beneficial roles and uh, decomposing things. So um, not all chytrid funguses can be harmful, but this particular one is. Is there any other questions before we try to rustle up uh, some adult salamanders? I'm hoping that after they got done breeding that there's still a few adults under logs here close to the vernal pool so we can show you the two different species. That's uh, great. One, My only other question, Ken, would just be in your experience, do, do, do landowners often, um, I have a friend here, <laughs> do, do landowners often uh, fill in their vernal pools? Is that a common problem um, in your experience in Western New York? I would say yes. Um, you know, it just kind of breaks my heart to see a farmer uh, filling in a pool that, you know, once supported wood frogs and um, maybe, you know, other species of amphibians. It does happen. People just don't realize, um, you know, the importance. For instance, this pool here probably supports, you know, wood frogs um, that, you know, disperse out into the forest as well as uh, spring peepers. And those two amphibians are going to be feeding on insects. And if you're a forest owner, many times you're concerned about, you know, insect outbreaks in your forest. Well, it's important that, 
to try to preserve some of the natural controls of insects and wood frogs and spring peepers and other amphibians are important, you know, natural controls. But yeah, um, unfortunately, vernal pools do get damaged and, and filled in. Okay, I think that's all our questions for now, unless Ron, you had anything you wanted to add um, or anybody else. So I'll open it up, you know, for anyone to, to jump in with a question and we can start moving when you guys are ready. Okay, we're gonna tune or turn a few logs and structure here and see if we can actually find some salamanders. So um, if you guys see a nice log you want turned, you just tell Jackie to turn it over, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do all the way. <laughs> So as we're doing this log turning, I just want to encourage everyone to bring out your inner child and do this at home. <laughs> uh, but if you do this at home or in your local park, please put the log back so you're maintaining that little home for all the creatures that you're looking at. That's very important, Robin. We try to uh, not disturb the, uh, the habitat while we're doing our surveys. This is where we need about uh, 15 to 25 <laughs> students. <laughs> we miss you. So if you're looking for places to take a peek for salamanders, I know Grand Island has some good spots. Buckhorn Park's a good spot. Um, bring your non-DEET tick spray. And uh, that that's, has some good vernal pools. Nature View Park in Amherst has some great vernal pools. Uh, more wood frogs there than salamanders. Um, and just throwing a couple ideas out there for your social distance hiking. Um, if you want to go a little bit south um, to Genesee Road, the Erie County forestry land off of Genesee Road is a great place uh, for salamanders. Totally wild hiking area there with a little parking parking zone off, uh, again, Genesee Road and the Erie County forest land there. It's about a thousand acres and there's lots of good hills and good places to turn logs and look for our friends. Now, if we were here in person, we would still be hunting and looking. <laughs> Not necessarily successfully, so this is nature. This is the hunter-gathering lifestyle, right? Looking for our amphibian friends. And so while Ken and Jackie are looking, I'm going to mention something. I don't know if they can hear me right now, if they're close enough to hear me. Um, but we are going to be asking Ken about the mythical largest salamander. Um, we won't ask any secrets to be told, but uh, this, is, this is an organization that helps to preserve that mythical largest salamander known as the Hellbender, the Eastern Hellbender Salamander. And I'm actually going to post a couple photos here while you guys are hunting of our Hellbender friend, just in case we can't find any of his, of his tiny relatives. So I'm going to attempt to do a little bit of a, a share screen here. And 
My host has disabled screen sharing. Um, I need your help here to enable my screen sharing so I can share these these photos with the peeps. Robin, you should be able to share now. Thank you, Colleen. <laughs> You're yep. my host. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see here. Let's look at this guy. He's got a little bit of a dinosaur look to him. Is he sharing or is he cut into pieces? Hmm. He's like a little bit double. Can you guys see his pretty face? We, we can see him. We see a, a part of a second, but we do see the entire one photo also. Okay. So these guys are really big, um, very rare in need of help and saving. I'm gonna ask Ken to talk a little bit more about them so I won't, I won't say too much other than to say that if you get to see one of these, you are very, very, very lucky. And I will share a couple more. Oops. So we're hunting and looking here. And if anyone else has questions, thoughts on the things we've been discussing while they're looking and while I'm looking through my documents. Robin, how big can those hellbenders be? Three feet, somewhere in that range. Um, I think there was a 29-inch uh, one pulled out of one of our local waterways, but they are pretty rare. So this is a really big animal. Oops. One more here. <laughs> okay, can you guys see this friend? Okay. So you can see his little feet there. Not that little. And uh, so this animal's head is like the size of your hand. They're big critters. <laughs> So the salamanders that Ken and Jackie are looking for are, are little guys. So Val is telling us that Roger Torrey Peterson Institute has two on loan from state, probably the DEC, um, in the tank in the lobby. Vale, is that institute open right now or are they totally shut down? Or I don't know if you know if you've been out there, but that's that is a, a hey, Robin. Yep, go ahead. Um, okay, so they actually are closed down because I'm in constant contact with the ICDH. We do a book club with them once a month and we're doing that now via Zoom, but they closed down the institute I think a little over a month ago. But it is open to the public and anybody can actually walk in there. You don't have to remember to go. Well, you have to, if you want to see what's on display as far as like the exhibit, you have to have a tank. But the tank is in the front lobby. So you can actually see the tank when you first walk in. You don't actually have to go in and make the food. It's, you know, it's, it's a good size tank by like four, three by three, four by four. Um, but you can actually just walk in and you don't have to see the food. Okay, so that's great advice. If you want to see the Hellbender, um, you can you can check them out when Roger Torrey Peterson Institute in Jamestown opens back up, which shouldn't be too long now. Um, 
Okay, Ron, if you are there near us, um, Ron, are you still with us? <laughs> yep, Ron, back. So I'm going to say maybe, well, maybe we can talk a little bit about Hellbenders. Alex has a little video he posted. Maybe we could see if um, either Jackie or Ken would tell us a little bit about Hellbenders while the other two of you are looking for the for the local salamanders okay sure so see if you can see i don't know did they escape <laughs> uh, they're right here it's awfully fun on this preserve it's hard to stand in front of a camera when there's so many logs to turn over <laughs> it might be a little cool for the salamanders okay uh, not a slug <laughs> and so well, a lot of centipedes what is our, that's a really good point though. What is our temperature there, Jackie? What are you guys experiencing? Because you're a lot higher than we are uh, in the I north. Think fifth, low 50s. Okay. So what would be the ideal time to go hunting? A little bit warmer and still raining? That's a real good question for Ken. I actually asked him that uh, a little while ago. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, I know they do like rain. When we do the saliva, salamander survey in March, it is cold and it is raining and it is at night and they're out in force. So as far as temperature, they're very tough. Tell, we did, tell us like, a, oh. did the um, salamander survey on March 28th and we captured 30 in this pool. Okay, so and that's at nighttime. Tell us a little bit about that event and if people are really into salamanders, can they participate in that event like through through me or through you? Absolutely. Uh, Welcome guests of members. Um, anybody really interested in the project, they're welcome. Um, so we were going to do it this year. It looked like March 24th around there was perfect, but we had to of course cancel because of uh, COVID-19. But so that's the time. Um, Mr. Robley thinks like a salamander and I don't know how he does it, but he calls these perfect nights when you climb this steep hill and you come out and both species of salamanders are moving from their winter homes in the forest to this vernal pool. And uh, it is amazing. You have to be careful where you walk because there is just a carpet of salamanders. And I, it was on my bucket list last year. I finally got to see this and it is remarkable. So we'll be doing this every year and it is research. So we log how many we find. We log, uh, last year they were all males. There was one female. And uh, every year we'll be doing this uh, research for the uh, mole salamander migration. Great. And that, so that happens at, sort of the end of March usually that when it first starts warming up and you have the snow is all melted already and, and then everybody starts moving? Yep. Yep. And there may be a little snow on the ground. They're, again, they're very tough, but it's that late March uh, time period. That's great. And I think for, for those of you in the North Towns, if you're looking for the salamander migration night in your area, North Towns, I'm going to say, are probably a couple of weeks ahead one to two weeks ahead of the high country. Um, so, you know, maybe more like mid-March. Does that sound right? That sounds right to me. Yeah, we're in the snow belt down here. Yeah. Okay. Jackie, could you tell us a little bit about the Hellbender uh, salamander and some of the efforts without being specific because it's secret and protected, but tell us tell us why it's a secret and, and you know, what you think about them. <laughs> I would love to, and perhaps Mr. Robley will model his hellbender sweatshirt later. He's wearing a hellbender sweatshirt that someone gave him. Uh, he, we've even had people dress up in hellbender suits. The zoo owns a beautiful hellbender costume, and we had my husband in it at our annual meeting last year to try to promote expanding our Hellbender Sanctuary, which is our newest sanctuary. Uh, it is in Southern Erie County. I can tell your group, we can't tell the general public, uh, many of our species, we really have to keep it uh, on the DL because of poaching. We have uh, turtles in our Houghton Bog that would go for $900 each on the black market. The, 
illegal wildlife uh, market. So we really have to keep these uh, these preserves rather secret. And uh, the species Jackie, I'm 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 going to stop you for a second, and I'm stopping you because at some point we may post this video to YouTube. So I don't want you to give any specifics, even though we trust our friends here. <laughs> okay, thank you. I will not. Uh, the names of the turtles until I see you, and uh, we net we really uh, hold back on exact locations. So uh, uh, on our uh, Facebook page, on our website, we ask our members to freely post photographs, even but not location. So um, so back to the hellbenders. They are amazing, and I've uh, being a, a new friend to Mr. Robley and acquiring our new preserve. I've learned a lot about them. They're, they're just remarkable. They're nocturnal and um, they only come out from under these big slabs of rocks that they live in. They're, they live under, they're about this thick and just huge rocks. And they only come out from under, under those uh, about one week in August for breeding. They're um, passive predators. They just wait under the rocks for their prey to come by. And they love crayfish. That's one of the main stays of their diet. Uh, some people say they're ugly. I think they're beautiful. <laughs> they have little ruffles on the side of their body. Their entire skin is a breathing organ. So it's fascinating. And so wherever they are, the water has to be pure and clean. So this new sanctuary is again uh, on Ishway Creek and it's um, a beautiful spot. It's just a beautiful, flowing stream and they're quite happy there. There's one we know there that is 30 years old at least. Uh, Mr. Robley as a wildlife biologist has tagged about 70 of them and there's a, so there's an estimated 150 which is the largest known population in New York State. And um, they're uh, under consideration to be uh, put on the threatened status list. So that's very important and very interesting. We hope they make it so that they will get even more protection. So we have in late July, you're welcome to come on that, it, we clean up the sanctuary. The sanctuary is a steep, steep hillside and we bought that just in the nick of time to save it from logging. And this is a very important part of their habitat because those large slabs of stone come off the hillside and into the water. If that was logged, it, it could have done in the habitat. So we uh, purchased that and now we're trying to expand the sanctuary uh, with about uh, seven, maybe 14 more acres to protect uh, that section. So cross your fingers for us. We hope that's, that's gonna come through. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> uh, we had a couple questions pop up. I'm going to, I'm going to run them by you. And then, um, yeah, is, is Ken still hunting and looking? <laughs> yeah, he's just okay. crazy. <laughs> so that's, that's fine. I'm going to run these by you anyway, and we can discuss them. Um, is it habitat loss or hunting that has caused them to become endangered? And also, are they only found in the Northeastern U.S.? Oh, uh, speaking about the hellbender, so what are really the threats that they're facing? Well, down at where our sanctuary is in southern Cattaraugus County, you can't believe the gravel pits. And I say certainly habitat loss is, is on that list. Here's our salamander guy. Without a salamander. Um, <laughs> I think it may be so dry up here that they're able to go quite deep. Uh, they are mole salamanders. and for most of the year, they live underground. Um, when it's at certain times of the year, they come closer to the surface. You can find them under rocks and logs. But with the cool temperatures we've had, they may have on this particular area up here, they may be down deeper than we can reach them. So, how deep do they go? Oh, they can go several feet. They follow small mammal burrows down. They don't necessarily dig their own burrows. Um, they Use vole burrows, um, short tailed shrew burrows underneath logs. And so, and you know, if you got rock areas, 
with, uh, you know, broken rock, they can fall the crevices down uh, many feet to survive the winter. So I think if we're done up here, maybe we could progress down the slopes where the, the soils are more clay and uh, they might be closer to the state. We might have a chance to get some. We have a couple of hellbender questions. Oh, great. Yep. I'd love to have all the questions. So, oh. guys, do you, do you think we can walk and talk with hellbenders, or is it going to be too hard with the terrain? I leave that up to your impressions there, folks. <laughs> walk and talk with hellbenders? Yeah, can, um, we, can we talk to you while we're walking, or is it going to be too hard with the terrain? Ron, that might be a question for you. I can, <clears throat> I can turn the video off. You could still hear. That way it's not jumping around. Oh. I have to show you my helmeter oh, sweatshirt. <laughs> uh, this is given to me by one of the landowners that I contacted to get permission to survey hellbenders on her property. Uh, she lives in Portville with her husband, and they let us on. We showed them hellbenders, and now they're some of the greatest fans of hellbender protection, uh, the Fisher family from Portville. So uh, they gave me this, and I wear it proudly. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems like how do they make their own uh, audience? They make their, their own fans. <laughs> yeah. Um, people seem to love them. Um, and we're getting good results in terms of protection and people willing to, uh, you know, sell property and work with us for protection. So uh, it's been a great quest. Now, what were the other hellbender questions? The, uh, what are the, the reasons for their loss? Habitat destruction, what else? Or hunting, uh, that was the main question. Was it habitat loss or hunting or something else that's, you know, caused them to be uh, in, in such danger? And also where are they found geographically? Okay, they're in the Mississippi drainage um, in the United States. Also the Susquehanna drainage. Now the Susquehanna population has plummeted. There's um, back in the 80s, there was enough hellbenders to actually do telemetry studies and surveys of them. But after that, um, into the 90s, and well, I think the last surveys were done in the 90s, and the, the population just plummeted. And at the present time, uh, there's only one location where they can locate hellbenders in the whole Susquehanna drainage within New York State. Um, there's just a few animals there. I think there's just, you know, less than a handful of animals that covered, maybe just, it might even only be one or two uh, at this time. So in New York State and the Susquehanna, situation is quite bad. In Pennsylvania, uh, Further down the Susquehanna, they do have uh, decent populations, especially in the west branch of the Susquehanna River. They seem to be doing better there in Pennsylvania. The other location is the Allegheny River drainage in New York State and uh, also in Pennsylvania. Uh, the hellbenders in the Allegheny drainage in New York are holding their own. We, the, when I was working uh, in 2013 and 14, we did surveys and we actually saw a slight increase at monitoring sites. So the hellbender has uh, held its own here in the Allegheny drainage. Uh, we were concerned about chytrid fungus being a problem, but surveys that we did where we swabbed hellbenders, we found that actually about between eight and tw some, in some locations, uh, I think around as high as 20% of the adults were infected with chytrid, but they were dealing with it. And apparently their immune systems were able to handle the fungus so it wasn't a problem in the wild population. So it doesn't look like chytrid is a threat uh, to our hellbenders because they have acquired some nat a natural immunity, um, possibly through beneficial bacteria on their skin. Uh, the other, the reasons for the hellbender decline in the Susquehanna is probably the quality of the river habitat there. Uh, they've had pollution problems in the Susquehanna. The Allegheny has fared better 
Uh, the water quality seems to be a little better here. And again, the numbers have held their own. We did notice a slight increase. Poaching was a concern. We have had hellbenders poached and removed from uh, their habitats here in, in the Allegheny drainage. Uh, that is a concern, but they become, they are native amphibians and reptiles came under protection in 2006. Uh, so they are now, there's seasons on snapping turtles and uh, there may be another, um, can't really remember the name of the turtle that's also taken for meat. But as far as the rest of the reptiles and amphibians, they're uh, completely protected in New York. So that's been a great help. Uh, we can prevent people from you know, removing them from their habitat. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I, oh, go ahead. No, I doubt that's all. I think we ought to try to turn a few more logs on that wet slope and see if we find something. I wanted to explain something very strange that happens with mole salamander populations. And if we can find one so you can look at it, I, we might be able to talk about uh, asexual populations of uh, these uh, creatures and uh, cloning that they do. So I think we ought to try to get down the slope. There's a few logs down there where it's quite wet and we might be able to find some. Okay, let's head, where well, they're gonna head down the slope. Ron's turning off the video so you guys don't get dizzy. Um, and we have, I know we have a couple outstanding hellbender questions. We can talk about those um, when we get to the bottom. Um, it's difficult to do that while we're hiking. Ron, I'm not sure we'll be able to hear Ken um, while we're trying to hike down the slope. So um, I think that's fine to, to go ahead and hike. Um, so okay. this time, yep, go ahead. I was just saying, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a good time to, uh, if you have some questions for Jackie and for Ken um, about either the work of the Nature Sanctuary Society, um, the salamanders, now the mole salamander is the one we're looking for right now, and that's a smaller salamander that would be potentially under logs and debris <clears throat> in the forest here. Um, and then the, just to keep things clear, the other salamander we were talking about that Ken was talking about that is, uh, protected is the hellbender salamander. That's the huge salamander that I posted those pictures of. That's the eastern hellbender. Uh, so that's a really important animal too. So we have a couple more questions on hellbenders that we'll address when we get um, down to the bottom. And uh, yeah, they'll take a look for our little mole salamanders. And I think Jefferson's is the other salamander species we're looking for. Um, so now is also a good time if you guys have any thoughts or stories of salamanders, I'm going to let you jump in. Um, now, I won't pick on anyone specifically because that's mean, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're going to be kind of following them down the slope here. So does anyone have any salamander thoughts, stories? Um, I heard a rumor that someone's writing a salamander song. We have friends here from different geographical areas who are welcome to jump in. We have um, friends, guests, relatives. So if you have anything that you want to say about salamanders, now is the time to do it. Otherwise, we can use this as a peaceful um, meditation. <laughs> <laughs> salamanders, Alex is laughing at me. <laughs> salamanders are a great species to meditate on because they're very mellow and, ha and harmless. <laughs> Not alarming in any way. Charmander is a salamander. Who is Charmander? Is this a Pokemon. Pokemon. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Does anybody know what that sounder may be? Ron, get as close as you can. Oh, there we go. And then stop moving. This is one of New York's most common salamanders. Nobody has a get. To get much bigger, Ken? Uh, this is about nearly the, the uh, you know, maximum adult size. This is an Allegheny Mountain dusky salamander. Now, this is not a mole salamander. This is 
salamanders in the uh, family Plethodontidae. And these are lungless salamanders. The mole salamanders do have lungs and use them. But these guys respire through their skin. So uh, if you were to pick these up with your bare hands on a warm day, um, this guy would quickly dry out and become stressed. So I've, you know, I want to try to keep him moist here today. Um, but this is uh, the Allegheny Mountain Dusky in the family Plethodon today. Uh, the genus is Des Desmognathus and the species name is Acrophius. Yeah. Ken, are they you have wearing gloves uh, to protect the salamanders? Is that because of chytrid fungus? Yeah, I just, um, you know, I want to try to change gloves between the, the animals and um, just protect them. That's one thing that herpetologists can do to protect animals, you know, the spread of disease and the animals they're studying is by, you know, using gloves and changing them. So real common salamander, the um, quite dark. This is a, an older, um, an adult, so it's, it's pretty dark. The young ones, you can see some chevrons along the backbone and this one's too dark to see that. If we find a juvenile, um, we may be able to see some chevrons along the back. But a lungless salamander and uh, in a different family. So that's kind of a nice find. I, I expected we would find some of these guys. Um, okay, we're going to put them back here. And, uh, the, the way you're supposed to um, replace rocks and logs um, you try to get them down so they're in about the same distance above the soil as before. You put the rock back or the log and then you let the guy crawl back into his home. And we do a similar thing with the hellbenders too. That way they don't get crushed when you're putting the rock back. So I think we'll and we'll turn some more logs and we'll hopefully we'll find uh, Jefferson Salamander. So that again was the Dusky Salamander and Alex has posted a little link uh, the Allegheny Mountain Dusky Salamander, if you want to take a peek and see some more photos of that animal. Um, that's who we are looking at here. And again, we are at Alexander Preserve Cataraugus Drainage. Um, for those of you thinking geographically where we are right now, um, we're a little bit west of Springville, a little bit west and south of the uh, little city of Springville. And uh, we have a comment um, from Karen uh, in Florida, our biologist friend in Florida who's joining us today, uh, Karen Relish, and she's mentioning that in Florida we have greater sirens and, and amphiumas and they use gloves with them because they bite. <laughs> so we have biting salamanders. So I stand corrected, some salamanders do bite. I don't think we have any biting salamanders here in the north. Um, but life is a little bit more competitive in the south where it's sunny and there's lots of predators. <laughs> um, so a little more biting friends there in, in the southland. Thank you, Karen, for that. And I do remember seeing a greater siren. They're also a really large animal. Um, as, you know, a lot of times we think of amphibians as being little. Um, sirens and the hellbenders are not little. <laughs> So, Ron, we don't have video. Did you, are you guys on the move? Did you turn it off to be on yeah, the Yeah, we're moving down the slope.
So somebody's writing a salamander song. Did I hear you correct? I I heard a rumor that we have a salamander songwriting friend. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Which would be pretty cool. Sorry, are you close enough, Ron, for me to ask a couple of our questions as you're moving? Maybe. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, so we had a couple of questions going back on the uh, hellbender, those big guys, the big salamanders. And, um, you know, one of the questions was from Vale, are they ever on land or are they strictly aquatic? My understanding is that they're strictly aquatic, but if Ken is in hearing range and he wants to talk about their lifestyle, um, aquatic lifestyle, and then also how, how can you tell how old they are as adults? Okay. Um, they're totally aquatic. In the literature, there's only a couple of instances where people have observed them out on a rock. So they're, they're restricted to the streams you travel in the stream. Okay, the, what was the second question? I lose the, my train of thought when I go after, mm -hmm. <laughs> turn logs and go after salamanders here. Um, Robin? How do you tell how old they are? How, do you, how can you tell the age on the, on the hellbender okay. salamander? Well, we're, when we're doing surveys, we essentially take measurements of the length and we take weights and we do a size um, age class distribution of the survey site. So we're just kind of getting a ballpark idea of the age by the the length of the hell vendors. You know, we haven't, I'm not aware of any method of uh, aging other than the, the size uh, age class work. I mean, people may be trying to section bone or something, but I haven't really read on that. They can get the re the record is twenty nine inches, uh, as far as I'm aware, and uh, we did have a call come in once from the Seneca Territory of one being observed at thirty inches, but we weren't able to get it before the man released it. So um, there's potential, you know, a potential record out there in our area. What are they preying on, Ken? What are they What are they eating? Are they fish eaters? They eat some small fish, but largely crayfish. They're, they're sit and wait predators. Uh, they use suction feeding uh, and lunging to uh, incorporate crayfish and, you know, small fish. And we, we have seen them out at night hunting on the stream bottom, walking around and, you know, looking for food. But uh, for the most part, they're probably sit and wait predators. They stay under their home rock and wait for crayfish to uh, enter and, and they catch them that way. And fish too. So uh, I was going to talk about the asexual salamanders when we found the Jefferson. In, at this uh, pool we have not just Jefferson salamanders but we have a population of asexual um, female salamanders that breed in the pool with the uh, Jeffersons. And you can go online and look up the unique breeding that the Jeffersons and blue spotted salamanders uh, undergo. Uh, there, there is a hybrid form that we find with blue spotted salamander populations such as we have on Grand Island in the Boulder area. And then there's another different asexual population that resides with Jefferson salamanders down here in Southern Tier. Uh, and those uh, female salamanders actually clone. That's how they reproduce for the most part, is through cloning. There is some, um, there's a name for the breeding. That's, uh, and I can't remember. The normal reproduction, syn synoptic or something like that. Uh, cinema, maybe cinematic reproduction, 
is the normal reproduction. There's that. There's some of that that occurs uh, in the uh, asexual females, but for the most part, it's they're just reproducing an exact copy of themselves. And how they do this is through gynogenesis. Uh, the female uh, asexual has to be in the company of males of either the blue spotted um, native population or the Jefferson population. And they take up uh, the sperm um, from the, the pure strain population, males, and but it's not incorporated into their egg. It only stimulates the, um, the ovum to divide and it results in a replication or a clone of that asexual female. Now they're also able to, in some cases, to increase their ploidy or the number of chromosomes. And so they would do the synapse normal reproduction where they actually incorporate the genes from the sperm into the ovum. Okay, and this is, it happens occasionally. And when that happens, then they can go from being, um, say, triploid up to uh, tetraploid and even pentaploid. So they can have five copies of chromosomes. And so that is going on in this pool. We have Jefferson salamanders, plus we have the, um, the asexual females here uh, with them. So that's a pretty interesting you know, phenomenon in nature to imagine animals that have genomes that are, you know, not just diploid, but up to pentaploid. And biologists feel that this is, can be an ecological uh, or an evolutionary advantage because it increases genetic diversity. Those, uh, animals, those asexual salamanders have more genes to, you know, deal with problems in the environment and uh, thus a better chance to survive. Some um, herpetologists have termed that increase in ploidy through stealing genes from other populations as uh, kleptogenesis. So if you want to go online, you can read about kleptogenesis and uh, it will um, you know, describe what is taking place in mole salamander populations with these asexual females. So that, that was an interesting point, and uh, so far we haven't found a Jefferson, so I can, um, or any of the asexuals, so um, we're going to have to do more searching to turn up them. And maybe we'll turn logs as we retreat down the hill. Any other questions? Um, sure. I, we are running short on bandwidth, Ron, so I'm thinking we may, as you go down the hill, it's getting harder to see you guys. Um, okay. So I'm wondering if we should ask a couple of questions and then wrap up here, or if you, if there's a spot down that hill that you think you'll get a better signal. Uh, yeah, we can ask a few questions here and wrap up, and then uh, I know there was a spot down by the road that Ken maybe wanted to try, so we can. Uh, try again when we get down there and see how the signal is. Okay. Uh, well, I don't want to keep people on waiting too long. Uh, so, how, how what's our what's our hike like to get down that to that spot? Oh, that's it's probably probably too long. It's probably about okay. 20, 20, 25 minutes. So, do we have any oh, final questions? Like oh, 10, yeah. 10 minutes, I guess. Should okay, I'm going to say that we'll probably wrap up here because I do want to check in with our college students too for a couple of minutes. So okay. I'm concerned about the bandwidth seems to be worse as you guys go down. <laughs> so I don't I don't want to make people wait too long. Um, so if if you guys could if you have some questions um, that you want to post and then I had a couple of things that I wanted to to um, um, put forward here for us to discuss. So is this a good spot? Can you turn on our video here and do it here? Is that okay? Yep, one second. As soon as he gets a hold of a tree so he doesn't slide to the bottom. <laughs> okay, yep. Yeah, the yeah, uh, signal definitely gets worse at the bottom of the hill. So I think yeah. here will probably be the last of our good signal. Yeah, and it's a great, it's a great 
place and i yeah i don't i don't want i think at the bottom of the hill it'll be hard to see uh, we can still see the trees now <laughs> so i did want to I wanted to put a question out there for Ken and for Jackie to just for people to think about um, you know, what can people do either on their in their own lives on their own property you know in association with the places that they love whether they're private property or, or public uh, what can they do to help salamander populations um, in general my understanding is that salamander populations are threatened so how can we uh, how can we help them? What can people do in their lives to, to help them out? And we talked about a little bit about the, uh, you know, the importance of those vernal pools. Um, what, what, what would you recommend that people do? Well, um, they could support us uh, at the Nature Sanctuary Society of Western New York because we're actively buying critical habitats and looking for more critical habitats to protect. So we're one organization who's, that's actively, you know, trying to get some of those places protected. In, in general, um, first protect critical habitats like vernal pools, you know, learn to recognize them. You know, there's some nice handbooks that are available you can purchase. I know that I think Massachusetts put out a real nice one on vernal pools. You can learn more about them and learn to identify them and you know, which can lead to their protection. And then aside from the pools, uh, protect um, intact forests. You know, if I think of Grand Island and there's a number of forest blocks that are still intact. They're not um, areas that were planted, they're natural. They have understory, they've got, you know, spring ephemerals, you know, on the forest floor. They've got a canopy, they got shrub layers. And this is what supports you know, healthy salamander populations. It's intact forest. You can't just go, you know, on Arbor Day, plant a tree and get a forest. A forest is pretty complex and uh, you know, protecting him, I think intact forest is going to be more important as we, you know, progress on as a society. Jackie, do you uh, not much to add, except I would say uh, there are so many organizations like ours working to save the natural world, which we are a, a part of, and uh, it just needs, it's so important to work hard to protect nature now. So whatever you can do, groups like ours love volunteers, and um, literally in your own backyard, uh, you don't use pesticides, herbicides, things like that. I wanted to show you this log because of if, if you look around the sanctuary, when a tree falls down, we just let it go. And uh, an example right here is this beautiful log that is just amazingly covered with moss, becomes a salamander habitat perhaps, becomes soil eventually. So literally in your own backyard, uh, you can do nature really wherever you are. You can help protect nature with, um, you know, friendly, uh, nature friendly practices. And again, I want to say what an honor it's been to be with you today. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I had one more question. We will see you soon. <laughs> we, we, we have one more question that I wanted to, to run by you, both of you too. Um, as far as looking for salamanders and salamander hunting, I know I listed a few places while you guys were walking, um, but a lot of our friends here are from Erie and Niagara counties. Um, so Ken and Jackie, do you have favorite places to look for amphibians? Uh, Ken mentioned Grand Island. I'm a Grand Islander and we have a couple Grand Islanders here. Uh, but other than Grand Island, are there other places in the North Towns uh, that you like to look for salamanders? What do you say, Ken? He's combed all the counties. Yeah. He knows the hot spots. I used spots. to work out of Buffalo. So um, the, the Niagara Escarpment uh, is a great place to find both the plethodonids, the lungless, as well as uh, the mole salamanders. Uh, so the Niagara Escarpment, there's, you know, there's several places that have parks along the escarpment, uh, public areas you can get in and take a look. The Onondaga Escarpment is another one. There's a place in Clarence. Uh, it's a great place. Um, can't remember the name of the road, but um, that would be a good place to uh, check out. I, I found salamander uh, at the base of the Griner. Uh, I think it's Griner. Yes, uh, the Clarence Escarpment. 
escarpment sanctuary. So that would be a good spot. Uh, the Gulf Wilderness Area in Lockport. Uh, I used to take my herpetology students uh, out to that area there. So um, those are some of the nice places uh, locally. Uh, Tift Preserve has blue spotted salamanders. Um, so yeah, there's opportunities. And actually right in the city of Buffalo, there's blue spotted salamanders under railroad ties along the railroad, the railroad right away. So, um, there's opportunities close to Buffalo. That's great. All right, well, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Jackie. Um, we do have, if you want uh, to get a little more involved with Nature Sanctuary Society, um, we do have a, a brochure that went around. I, I emailed you guys the brochure. Um, we are gonna be with Jackie one more week next week um, to look at another one of the, the Nature Sanctuary Society preserves and talk about riparian buffers and, and just take a look at a, a, a fen habitat, which is a, a really a rare place. Uh, not just with rare species, but an actual rare place. So we'll talk about that next week. Um, a little, it's a little further north. It, it may, we may have a little easier time with the bandwidth there. Uh, but hopefully you guys got a good look at the forest here, a good look at some of our salamander friends. And uh, we're going to say goodbye. Goodbye, Ken. Goodbye, Jackie. <laughs> Bye. Uh, Bye. Thank you, guys. And I would ask ECC students, if you guys can stay on with me, we wanna do a quick check-in with you guys. It's gonna be really quick. I just wanna see how you guys are doing um, and talk about our projects for a minute. And uh, other than that, unless you guys have any last words to add, I know Ken's still looking. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna sign off and we'll see you guys next week. All right, have a great hike, guys. <laughs> okay, goodbye, friends.